Well, good morning. So isn't it interesting how we don't always even know how we feel? We, we don't think we're scared when we are. We don't think we're afraid when we are. And we think of that a lot. And we rec- listen, we recognize it in the physical, right? When we're tired, don't we notice it? The older you get, first you make noise when you're getting up. And then as you get older, you make noise. Wait, wait, no, it's backwards. First you make noise when you're sitting down. Oh, then you make noise when you're getting up. Oh, that's the second stage. And then you just quit getting up. You're just like, I'm not getting up. Right? So physically we see it. Emotionally, sometimes we see it like when we lose it and we realize, ooh, I must have been ten- more tense than I thought. But spiritually, a lot of times we have no idea that we're struggling. So let me say a couple things real quick. I had people send me notes. First of all, Dave, do you know the first car in the Bible? No. They said we're all in one accord. No. Yeah, okay. So <clears throat> do they even make the accord anymore? Am I, is my joke outdated? By the way, thank you for that video. Randy, did you put that together? You're evil, but thank you so much. We appreciate you guys and all you do. Randy said, thank you for me fixing the toilet yesterday. Little did he know that all I did was break it, go to the store, get the parts, and let somebody else fix it. So Rodney vacuumed up stuff, and it was a great day yesterday. Everyone else worked hard, though. I appreciate all the people who helped at work day. And then some of our folks actually went from work day over to the port ministry and worked at the port ministry the rest of the day. Just amazing stuff. And... um, what a, we have such a neat church. I tell people all the time, I don't need, you know, they have Pastor Appreciation Month. Do you know why they have that? Because most churches are terrible to their pastors. I have Pastor Appreciation Month. You know how often I have it? 12 months a year. This church is so good. And I tell, I tell my staff all the time because they're like, well, we're going to put it in the bullets. And I'm like, no, I have it every week here. I appreciate you. And so anyway, so thank you so much. And I hate being recognized, but there you go. All right. Oh, what else was I supposed to say? Oh, the blood drive. Uh, we had the dates wrong, which is always a good start. Uh, uh, the good news is we now know when Diana's grandson's birthday is. So that's in the bulletin. But the blood drive is actually going to be like the 14th, I think they told me. So, but, if, but you also feel free to celebrate her grandson's birthday. Send her a note on the 7th and say happy birthday to your grandson. So I just want you to know how that got, number got there. So if you're here today, and, or if you're watching online and you're not a Christian, and we talk about the struggle of the soul, your question would be, why, why do I care? And here's why you should care. Because the soul is the eternal part of you. You know, all of us know that somewhere deep inside of us is something more than what we see in this life. There's something more than we can touch, something more than we can think about. It's beyond understanding. And and that part of us is that part that desires to know God, to have that relationship. And the truth is, though, if you're a Christian, if you're not careful, you'll start to grow stale as a Christian. You'll you'll start to just kind of go through the motions of life because without knowing it, you'll get a phone call. But without knowing it, you will try to fill the thing where you should be reaching for God with anything else. You'll try to fill it with distractions. You'll try to fill it maybe with alcohol, entertainment, God forbid, politicians, right? News channels. We fill it with whatever we think will fill us up. And the truth is, here's what we need today. And if you don't learn anything else today, you're going to learn this. Now, those in the back can't see this. I know my mom said... Eric, they can't see that. I said, well, I can't get a giant one. But the people in the front, what is this called? An inhaler. So how many of you have ever used an inhaler? Right? So, so how many of you know somebody who's used an inhaler? There we go. All right. So how many of you live in a cave? I live in a cave. Okay. So, so if you, and if you watch uh, Jimmy Neutron, you know that Carl has an inhaler that he accidentally sprays in his eyes all the time. And uh, Carl loves to bring it to show and tell and tell people about his inhaler. So what's an inhaler for? When your lungs are not opening the way they should, what do you do? You, you shake it up, right? And you, take, you breathe out, right? And then you take two puffs of the inhaler, right? And you hang on to it. And maybe you do that twice, okay? Or maybe one puff of the inhaler. Forgive me for giving improper instructions. Inhaler people, do what your doctor tells you. We do not give medical advice here on Sunday morning, unless my wife tells me to. So here's the deal. Why do we do that? Because there's times where all of a sudden there's things clogging up our lungs or whatever it is, whether it's an allergic reaction or pollen or asthma or whatever it is. And so we do that to open things back up. Here's the deal. 
if you're not careful, you will allow sin to permeate you. And sin's not necessarily those, we think of sin as these horrible things. It can be. Give me, you know, uh, we know that murder is sin. You know, we know that lust is sin. We know that, that all of these things are sin. But it can just be choosing anything other than God. And so here's the two things I want you to remember this week. If you don't remember anything else, if you want to take a nap, you know, Tim, if you've had enough and it's time for a nap, here's what I want you to do. I want you to practice exhaling, which is, Lord, I confess this to you. Whatever it is, you're going to confess to God, okay? When you, when you find that you have a wrong attitude and the Holy Spirit convicts you, confess to God, and then I want you to breathe in. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Lord, help me not desire things that aren't you. Fill me with your spirit. And, and so that we can begin to breathe out confession and breathe in being filled with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, because all of us get easily discouraged. We get distracted by life. We let other things become our focus. And life can be hard. Any, anybody in here think life can be hard? Do you think, right? Life can be hard, right? You forget your calendar. It throws you off. I texted Rodney Tuesday night. I'm like, hey, we missed you tonight. He's like, oh, oh no. Right? You ever had that happen? I showed up at a test one time. I didn't know there was a test. That was an exciting night. Right? Life can be hard. But if you're a Christian, we have a helper. And to help you have not just life, but the Bible says you can have abundant life. And so if you're a non-Christian and you're kind of listening today, maybe you tuned in online it could be the very thing that you're missing. The very thing you're searching for is not just satisfaction. It's not just peace. But it's fulfillment, where the Bible calls it in Romans 8, life and peace. So let's look at some things we struggle with, okay? Number one, we struggle with fear. We struggle with fear. Now, I don't know if you've ever really gotten freaked out in life. It's a lot of fun. There's, I'm very easy and very jumpy, so I'm easy to scare um, Steve actually uh, came to my office this week. I had my door open and I was working on something and he was standing in my doorway. If you want to die, the best thing to do is come and stand next to me and say nothing. Now, he told me I said something. Now, for some reason, I did not throw something at him. But Diane and Mike will tell you I am the jumpiest person you know. I freak out. The truth is all of us spiritually struggle with fear and our main fear and you know what our main sin is as christians is not recognizing that we're child and children we've been adopted by god here's what it says in romans chapter 8 we're picking up in verse 14 we'll be in romans 8 the next week this week and next week for those who are led by the spirit of god are the children of god so if you're a christian you have the spirit of god that means there should be times that you get a check in your spirit. There should be times that you're doing something or maybe you said something and the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about condemnation. Condemnation is something you can do nothing about. I'm talking about conviction. Hey, you need to apologize for that. Hey, you need to settle down. Hey, you need to take a breath when you're at a traffic light. Right? For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive, listen to this, does not make you slaves so you live in fear again. What's he talking about? Remember the garden, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, what'd they do? They ran away from God. There's times if we allow sin in our lives, the first, our first response is to run from God. But then it continues, rather, the Spirit you receive brought about, listen to this, your adoption to God. Sonship. Now, I have an adopted child. Can I tell you that they have every right in my house that all of my other children do? And many of you don't know, I have an adopted brother and sister. Did you know that they did not get preferential treatment in our home because they were adopted? Now, my brother got preferential treatment because he was the oldest, but that's totally different, right? They were just, so you are a child of God. He loves you just that much. And then it continues... And by him we cry, Abba, Father. That's Aramaic for Daddy. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. By the way, sometimes you just need the Holy Spirit to remind you, you know what? No matter how you feel today, no matter what dumb thing you did, no matter what you've been running after, God loves you. 
And then it continues. Now, if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings. Time out. I hate this part. Can we just cross this out of our Bibles? I can tell you right now, there's no TV preacher preaching about suffering this morning. We're just going to talk about the blood of Jesus and how everything's going well. And if you give money to me, you'll have more money. I, I would love to tell you that. I, I promise you, if you give money today to our church, if you give $20, when you leave here, you'll have 20 less dollars. I promise, okay? So, so here's the thing. So if indeed we share in his sufferings, what? So we may share in his glory. You know, life's not always easy. And if you're a Christian and you do what God wants you to do, can I tell you that life sometimes will be harder because you'll do what's right when nobody else is. The Lord convicted me of something this week. and I was, I was driving. That's a good time for me to think. And I drove a lot yesterday. I was over here three different times. And so I drove back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, which is always a good thing for me. And I, I was talking to the Lord about something. And I said, you know, that person didn't do this and didn't do what's right. So because of that, I'm not going to do this. And it was like the Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart. Oh, so you think you're only supposed to treat people right when they treat you right? Yes, that's what I said. Oh, man. That's how the Holy Spirit convicts you. It reminds us, hey, do unto others as you want them to do to you, not as they've done to you. And so sometimes, even when somebody's mean to us, nasty to us, doesn't do what we think they should do, guess what? Instead of punishing them, guess what we do? We bless them. We bless them. And it's so easy for me to say that. And so hard for me to do that sometimes. Listen to this verse, this, uh, this quote from the book. Your soul is vulnerable because it's needy. You're always reaching for something. If you meet those needs with the wrong thing, I love this, game over, or at least game not going well. If you're a part of AA, you've heard of HALT. You have to be careful of your reactions when you're hurt, when you're angry, when you're lonely, and when you're tired. It's halt, right? So they teach people that. But here's the deal. The truth is, for all of those things, those are the times that you will reach for something else to fulfill you. You'll look for entertainment. You'll look for relaxation. You'll look for a way out. Maybe you'll seek the wrong things. Maybe you'll look into pornography or, or maybe you'll watch more and more news trying to fill the void in your heart. Maybe you'll, you'll look towards somebody or something. Boy, if that just happened, then life would be okay. Breathe out. Father, forgive me for seeking other things. And Lord, would you fill me with your spirit because that's really what I need. Not all these things I'm seeking. Not all these things I'm making idle. So we struggle with fear. Number two, we struggle with failure. And I think for many of us, we're going to understand this next passage because we all groan. We all, as we get older, we have pains we never had. You know, when, when, when I was a kid, I fell out of a tree, fell onto a limb. It's in the hospital. They stitched me up. I went home. I had a, a, a thing on my arm for a few weeks, and then I was fine. There are days now I pick up a box the wrong way and for six weeks I'm walking around going, oh, I don't know what I did, what did I do? Or I sleep the wrong way, oh man, I don't know what's right. We groan. Listen to what it says here in the Bible because here's the deal. Many of us have chronic sin issues. We groan because we struggle with the same thing. You know, Paul talked about this thorn in his flesh that he struggled with. We don't know if that was a physical thing that he struggled with from being beaten or if it was actually something he struggled with, a desire that he had that he just couldn't overcome, where God finally said, my grace is sufficient for you. Listen to what he says. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits an eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. In the Phillips translation, it says the creation basically waits on tippy toes to see God work in us. It's an awesome thought. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hopes that the creation itself would be liberated from its bondage to decay. By the way, if you don't know what decay is, do a repetitive movement for a while. Sit at a desk the wrong way for a few hours. You'll feel the decay. And then it continues... And brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning. 
Would you go ahead and groan for me right now? Let me hear your best. I'm sitting down and my back hurts. Ready? One, two, three. That's, that's pretty good. Some of you are really good at that. Oh. oh. And you ever do the groan of just somebody, you get a phone call and you didn't like what the phone call was about? You know that groan? You know that groan? Let's hear that one. Ready? One, two, three. Oh, yeah, that one's different. All right, so here we go. So, so this is groaning. So the, so the creation's groaning in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, we ourselves who have the first fruit of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait. And this is talking about the final adoption to sonship, sonship the redemption of our bodies. See, while you're on this earth, your bodies will have needs. Even emotionally, you'll have needs. But spiritually, we can run to God and say, God, I'm trying to fill my spirit with other things. Forgive me for the times I seek. It might even be a good thing. When I seek fulfillment in that thing, Lord, forgive me and fill me with your spirit. I love what Jesus says in John 16. He says, unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. When he comes, he'll prove to the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin. Because people do not believe in me and about righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Now here's what I love about the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian, the Bible says the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. We know that one. We all talk about that one. Oh man, I just knew when I did that it was wrong. Okay. But then it says he also convicts us of righteousness. So it means not only does the Holy Spirit convict us when we do something dumb, right? Been there, said something, and like, oh, right? That same, when you get off the phone call, you have the same reaction to yourself. Oh, I can't believe, right? We know about the sin, but then righteousness, what does that mean? It means that the Holy Spirit will quicken you, will speak to you in your heart. When we talk about God speaking to us, it's not like Noah and the ark, okay? You're not going to be sitting at home one day and all of a sudden, Eric, build an ark, right? But what it'll be like, all of a sudden you'll think of somebody and think, you know what, I need to check on them. Don't take lightly those reminders, don't take lightly those little things. Hey, where's so-and-so? We need to check on them. This week, we had one of our folks missing from a Bible study, and I had not seen them the day before, and I thought, I wonder how they're doing. And so I said to one of our ladies, would you give them a call? Would you mind calling them? I said, if I call them, they think it's required. Would you call them? So they called and check on them. One of our ladies had fallen. We didn't know anything about it. Now, now how would I know that? I don't. You all know me. I'm not that smart. But the Holy Spirit's that smart. So so pay attention to those things, especially when it's anything that's unselfish. When you're supposed to go out of your way for somebody else, that's typically not you, just so you know. Because we tend to be cookie monsters, right? Me want drive fast. Me want to go out of my way. I'm not calling person. I'm taking nap, right? Whatever it is, it's whatever we want. I watch show. Me football. When the Holy Spirit speaks to us, it's, hey, Here's some way you can help somebody. Here's a way you can go out of their way to show love. The soul is healed by confession. Sin splits the self. It's better to be an honest mess before God than a dishonest saint. Now, let me tell you something about God. When you confess sin to him, he's not surprised. When you say, God, I did this, God doesn't go, you did? That's not what confession is for. Truthfully, confession is to remind us that we need him. And we surrender our, that area of our life to him, right? We breathe out, confession. We breathe in. Lord, fill me with your spirit. So easy for me to walk in my flesh. Number three, we struggle with even knowing our needs. We don't even always know what we want. You ever say that? I don't know what I want. They have done studies and found that a lot of people that think they're hungry, you ready for this? It's going to freak you out. Ready? Are thirsty. Did you know that? Isn't that weird? Your brain says, eat something. And your body goes, but I need a drink. But your brain goes, no, just eat something. And so we eat when what we need to do is drink. We're dehydrated. And for some reason, our brain says, eat. Eat food. Eat food now. And what we really need is water. And so try that next time you're feeling hungry, especially if you're trying not to eat 400 snacks a day. Go get a glass of water. 
Maybe the very thing you need. We don't always know what we need. And here's the deal. Listen to what it says. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? So, so we understand there's going to be a day that all of our pain, all of that, ugh, all the sorrow. But if we hope for what we don't yet have, we wait for it. What's the next word? Most hated word in scripture. Patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. You ever have a weakness? Holy Spirit, I need your help. By the way, sometimes our weakness is a person. You, do you have somebody who could just push your buttons? They're good at it. Just boop. I mean, it takes them three seconds. You're, and, and here's your comment about them. You know, I never get mad at anybody. Except, Holy Spirit, I need your help. I, I want to react in my flesh to that person. You leave me alone. But the Holy Spirit can help you. So it continues. But his spirit. And then it says this. We don't even know how to pray. But the spirit himself intercedes for us in wordless groans. By the way, sometimes I pray. God, show me how to pray. God, tell me how to pray for that person. I told a teacher this week that was having a hard time with a student. Something that I was told. Go and sit in that student's desk before school and pray for them. Because I guarantee if that student's changed, not changed, you still will be. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. We don't even know how to pray. We lose hope. We get frustrated. Now, Kristen and I have rules for hiking. And it goes like this. The hike must be less difficult than the value of the view. So here's one of the views we had. Did I put it in the right place? Yeah. Now, let me tell you about this hike. This is out in uh, uh, Vermont. And this hike was not very far. But before you get here, there is a steep drop. You've got to go down about 100 uh, rock stairs. And we watched people, as we went back up, we watched people come there, look, and turn around and go back to their car. Come there, look, and go back to the car. So I even said to some people, the view is worth the pain. I know that sometimes when you're a Christian, life is painful. And I know that it's suffering, if we're honest. Sometimes we struggle. But can I tell you something? The hike is worth the pain. I know maybe you're struggling with a besetting sin, some area of your life where you just, man, you're like, I just can't get over that. I encourage you, get somebody to walk with you through that. You don't have to do it alone, but also surrender that area to God, knowing that even if you're suffering through something, even if you're suffering through dealing with somebody and, and treating somebody in love that doesn't deserve it. Now, I'm not talking about being a doormat, by the way. I'm not talking about being, Jesus was never a doormat. But there's times where we have to surrender what we want to do what's right. By the way, sometimes surrendering what we want means that we have good boundaries. So we say to somebody, I'm not doing that anymore. I, I'm not going to give in to that anymore. And did you know that's painful? For some people, that's more painful than saying yes. But the view is worth the hike. If you'll do what God calls you to do, if you'll surrender to the Holy Spirit's leading, if you'll make those difficult choices of saying yes when the Holy Spirit says to say yes and saying no to the things where the Holy Spirit says to say no, if you'll begin to be sensitive to that, then the Bible calls that being filled with the Spirit. And when you're full of the Spirit, the Bible has this whole thing in Ephesians where it talks about you'll be full of joy and peace and life. And that's my hope. As you learn how to breathe out by confessing to God those areas where you're running from him. Where you refuse to surrender. And then breathing in. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I don't even have the power to do that. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. Jesus came and died for us because the truth is we all pursue sin whether we want to or not. We fall into it naturally. We, we grew up with a heart that pursued sin. Nobody had to tell us to be sinful. It's natural for us. But Jesus came and died to pay for our sins. 
So if you're here today and you've never surrendered to him, today you can say, Jesus, I know you are the way, the truth, and the life. I want to surrender my life to you. And the Bible says when you surrender your life to him, believing that Jesus died and rose again, that he trades your sin for his righteousness. Maybe you're here today and as a Christian, there's some areas of your life where you've allowed sin in. You haven't thought it's a big deal, but you know it's a big deal. And maybe you've even covered it up saying, but I need that. Just be honest with God. You can even be honest with God and say, God, I want to confess this to you, but I'm not ready to give it up yet. And say, Holy Spirit, would you help me even to be ready? Give me your power. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for these moments together. I thank you for each one. Lord, I pray that as we learn to breathe out in confession and learn to breathe in in the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would give us your strength. Father, I thank you for Paul who recognized in chapter 7 that he could not do anything in his own flesh. But I also thank you that through your spirit, we are more than overcomers, more than conquerors. Father, I pray for that one who's a Christian here today that's struggling with a besetting sin. Maybe they're struggling with a desire they've had for many years. And Lord, they keep asking you to take it away. I pray just like Paul that your grace would be sufficient for them. Lord, I pray, too, that you'd give us your desires. Make us sensitive to your spirit so we reach out to people around us and look for ways to love and encourage and bless. Lord, fill us with your spirit, with your power. We thank you for these moments together. In Jesus' name, amen.